elderly man entered between them. <clears throat> the doors closed behind him. Two minutes later, the doors opened, and rather than seeing the elderly man who originally entered, a handsome 20-something-year-old man emerges. Now, we know these doors are to an elevator, but it's something she had never seen before. Again, the doors open, and another old guy goes in. Soon after, a young, good-looking guy appears. The woman's granddaughter comes over and says, Granny, isn't this a great place? Yes, she replies to grandmother. Quick, go get your grandfather. <laughs> so, that's a good segue into the mystery of the microphone. Since the Trinity is uh, a mystery of our faith and hard for us to understand, it's an invitation not so much to try to figure it out, but to enter into it. And so here we have this mystery of God that you and I have come into by virtue of our baptism. Since that moment, we have had a relationship with God that we claim uniquely as our own. We have a relationship to God as our Father, and we have a relationship to Jesus as our brother, and basically the Holy Spirit's relationship with us is that inspiring moment, that breath that we need, that inspiration that continues to draw us more deeply into the life of the three in one, one in three. And if it were something that we were meant to grasp easily, it would have been made so, but it, it's not. And so down through the centuries, Christians have tried Theologians have tried, many people have tried, have come up with simple ways of, of trying to explain it, but everything in the end limps a little bit because even as many comparisons, metaphors, metaphors that we might use, in the end, they all fall short of the mystery because there is no human term no human word, no human concept that ultimately can tell us what this mystery of God is. <clears throat> but that is, God has chosen to reveal God's own self to you and to me by means of the self-disclosure, first of all, when he created the world, created the universe, created everything. That's part of this disclosure of God. And then, having a particular relationship with the first human beings, and then again, as we see in the, in the Old Testament, with Noah, and then continuously with various people until Abraham comes on the scene, and Abraham then becomes the father of many nations, Abraham being the one to whom God discloses himself as fully as possible at that moment in time. But that ultimate disclosure, or at least what seemed to be the ultimate disclosure, comes when Moses has his encounter with God in the burning bush. But God wasn't finished making this disclosure, this revealing of God's own nature until the coming of Jesus. Because when we look at Jesus, we listen to what Jesus says, we see what Jesus does, then we discover who God truly is. And the way we come into knowing that 
the way we come to experience that is by the gift of the Holy Spirit, who I said draws us ever more deeply into that very life of God. If it were something that we could easily figure out, we might not take it all so seriously. I'm sure that most of us don't stay up at night worrying about how to understand the Trinity either. But the point of the matter is, what makes Christians distinctive from other believers in the world is precisely this, this belief in God as three persons in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So if we want to look at it this way for a moment, it might help us. That first of all, the Trinity is a unity. It's a unity of the three persons. And when we look at the scriptures and we see how God went about creating, we see that in all of the scripture when it's talked about, in Genesis for example, God says that I will make everything in my image and likeness. Let us make man in our own image and after our likeness. God creates in God's own image, male and female. God created us. So nothing that you don't already know. But this is part of the reflection of the unity in the Trinity and how the Trinity operates. Because where one member of the Trinity is, the other two are as well. But then also, God is revealed in diversity. We have, all of us, different personalities. We have different backgrounds. We have different ways of thinking. We have different ways of looking at the world. We also have been given various and different gifts. And this is what we attribute to the Holy Spirit of giving us these gifts. Some of us have gifts for organization, some of us for teaching, some of us for administration, some of us for preaching, some of us for a variety of tasks. But all of us have something. Nobody has it all. But all of these are the gifts that come ultimately from God, whether they're gifts that influence how we live our daily life or how we express ourselves within the confines of the church. All of those gifts are ultimately from God, and those gifts from God are bestowed upon us by the Holy Spirit that's been given to us, as Paul says in Romans chapter 5. And then there's the aspect of the intimacy of the Trinity. That intimacy of the Trinity is expressed, first of all, when we look at the relationship the Father and Son. The Father and the Son love one another as completely as loving can be, beyond the human ability to understand, beyond the human ability, the human ability to express. And that love that is expressed between the two of them is the Holy Spirit the third person. But we are privileged in that this intimacy of the three persons in one God has been shared with us. Again, hearkening back to our baptism, we were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just a convenient handle or a nice thing to say, or just sort of a, a nice ritual to go through. But it was actually a life-giving moment when you and I experienced for the first time, although for the majority of us, had no clue what was going on, 
except that maybe the water was cold and it made us cry. Uh, we had no clue that what was taking place was this being taken up and into God's own life, starting now and going on eternally. All because God is a God who is a personal God. God is a person. God isn't just a force or an idea. And this power, this being, this person is one that knows us better than we know ourselves is one that calls us evermore into this life and who went all the way that you could possibly go, sending his only begotten Son, the second person of the Trinity, to be one of us in everything except for sin, so that you and I, through his death and resurrection, that we share in through our baptism, could be taken up into that intimate life with God, given the promise of everlasting life with God, given the promise of the action and the power and the strength of God being poured into us at this time of our being, from the moment of our baptism to this very moment now. And that will continue into eternity. What difference does it make? It makes a difference for the here and now and not just for later. Because it means that now you and I, who are these extensions, if you will, of the Trinity, of God, of the Lord, of the Spirit, have through the diversity of gifts poured out upon us, have a job to do. And we have power to do it. And we have strength to do it. The love that we are supposed to live, we have the strength and power to do by what has been given to us. And who it is that is with us. And the world that we live in is what God wants us to continue to serve. And to show that it is possible to live a different way than those who don't believe, than those who don't profess this faith. That it's possible to let love and justice and mercy predominate. That it's possible to look at the world in a different way than full of adversaries that we need to fear. And also to look at people, human beings, as fellow human beings, situated on this planet that we live in now. But all of that comes from the gift of, the, of God, the trinity of persons, and in particular for you and me, through what we do here, every time we gather around the Lord's altar. Because here, that faith, that baptismal gift is renewed. It is renewed particularly by our reception of Holy Communion. Because if our coming into Christ's body, becoming living members of Christ's body, and sharing in the life of the Holy Trinity began in baptism, every communion, every time we received Christ's body and blood, it's a reminder to us of our identity. It's a reminder to us that we already partake of the divine nature. It's a reminder to us that what we are called to is to live in such a way, to serve in such a way, to care in such a way, that people will know that God has been in their midst, that the Lord has touched their lives, not by being preachy, not by being pushy, but by being true servants, by being true signs of love and of patience and of compassion. And ultimately, then, by 
the living example of our lives, we show forth that this God of ours is not just an idea, is not just a projection, but is real, is alive, and is, can be experienced by others who are seeking a meaning for their lives, who are seeking, you know, what's it all about ultimately? And it's all for us the gift that we receive here that renews within us that very life that started at the font and will go on forever. So as we come to communion today, remember again who you are. Remember what price has been paid for us, what gift we have been given and what we should never trample underfoot or cast aside or denigrate in any way. Because God truly is with us so that we can truly be with God. And now 